going to try and balance this handheld mic with the space bar. I don't have a convenient guy to go forward and backwards. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a feature platform that we built at Gojek. Um, I'll start with, by talking a bit about Gojek um, itself, the company, and then go into a bit of detail on the design decisions that we made in building this feature platform and the problem we were trying to solve with it. So who or what is Gojek? So Gojek is an Indonesian company. It's a technology startup. And um, we have a wide variety of products and services. And as you can see on our app on the right there, um, those are just some of the examples of the products and services that we have. Um, the one that we're most famous for is ride hailing on motorcycles. So the reason why it's ride hailing on motorcycles is because um, in Indonesia there are some very unique uh, problems with traffic. So um, a lot of people don't know this, but Indonesia is one of the largest countries in the world by population. and um, they have a lot of congestion in the city, um, cities like Jakarta. And one of the ways in which Indonesians have solved the problem there is by having OJEKs, basically motorcycle taxis. And our first service was actually a, a call center. Basically a call center, you call in and then you'd get a motorcycle taxi sent to you. So it's offline, it's all telephonic, there's no application. And our founders are very data driven and they collected a lot of metrics on how people are using our service and they realized that there was a, a, a very big demand for m more services like this that uh, solved your logistical problems in, in, in Indonesia. So the traffic is so bad in Indonesia that people would often just spend hours, like three, four hours in traffic in a day. You'd plan your day around it. So we knew we wanted to deploy some services. And um, we launched our first app in 2015. So that was a, um, a six or so services that we originally launched. And uh, the main ones being ride hailing, uh, food delivery, uh, online shopping, grocery shopping, and logistic services. Since then, we've gone to become a unicorn. So in the last three years, we've gone from basically a call center to uh, a $5 billion company. Uh, we now have 18 services, and um, we, in 2018, are setting our sights on international expansion. So that's, that's the main thing we're looking at now. Um, it's, it's growing our footprint with, throughout Southeast Asia. So just some statistics on the scale. So um, we process around 100 million bookings a month. So we're an offline company, even though it's, it's a technology company, but it's physical things moving around. So if we're uh, talking about ride hailing, 100 million bookings a month. A typical, on a typical day, you'll have hundreds of thousands of drivers online at one time, just in Indonesia. And we're currently expanding into uh, Vietnam as well. Uh, we've just launched some of our services there. We're planning to launch in Thailand soon, planning to go to Singapore soon. Um, so the whole Southeast Asia is opening up to us. But just in Indonesia, the scale at which we operate is massive. So in all 18 products, most of them, we are the biggest player. So ride hailing, very big. But we have 250,000 merchants on our platform, so for food delivery. Um, just to give you some context, that means we're the largest by volume um, uh, food delivery service in Southeast Asia. And that's one, one of our products. Um, so to talk about data a bit, because that's why we're here, um, this animation doesn't really render very well, but it's basically each pixel is a trip that's starting or ending. So if somebody's being picked up or dropped off. So this gives you an indication of, in Jakarta, over a 24-hour period, um, how, much, how many transactions we do. So that's one data point that we're looking at. And so the data is very important for us because it affects everything we do in terms of decision making. So we have a lot of machine learning models that, that take this uh, data in real time and it'll um, make decisions based on that. So as part of the data science team, it's, it's my job to make sure that data scientists are efficient, what they do. It's, but it's not just about um, models that are efficient, but it's also about having access to information and understanding our customers. So one of the things that we set out to do as engineers in the data science team is to um, analyze how data scientists really are doing their work and see if we can improve their efficiency. So we had a look at how they were spending their time. So this is just a rough uh, time bar of basically how data scientists were spending their time. So what we found is that they were doing some tasks, like the colored tasks are data science related tasks, well, we, what we deem to be. And they were also doing some other tasks that were breaking the abstraction where they were entering into the world of engineering a lot. 
And especially if you have a company that's growing very quickly and has new teams where everyone has many hats to wear, this situation comes up a lot. So we identified two areas that we wanted to target to improve the efficiency of the data scientists. And the one is the data pipelines and the ETLs that create features, and that's on the left-hand side. And then it's the model serving side. For this, for, this, for this presentation, we're only focusing on the platform we built to solve this problem and not the serving side. But, but the feature engineering and the ETLs and the data pipelines and the fact that uh, data scientists were spending a lot of time on infrastructure and automation and scripting and things that they shouldn't be doing, um, that was really the problem we tried to solve. So the first problem in feature engineering that we encountered was uh, uh, pipeline jungles. So with these data scientists having to create their own pipelines, they'd often um, hack together their own solutions. So they'd use Airflow or they'd use Bash or Python or whatever they could find. And they'd scrape together raw data and they'd create some hacky Jupyter notebook or something. And they'd create pipelines from that. And they'd be very unstable and brittle. And before you know it, you'd have many of these pipelines in production that um, are just being duplicated they're building a lot of technical debt. They have weird interdependencies that you can't um, decode unless you're part of that project. So this is one of the main problems you're trying to solve is uh, this increase of tech debt in terms of data pipelines. Because you want to have a very flexible environment where people can just develop, but at the same time, you don't want to have to clean up and um, uh, be on call at night if any of these pipelines go down. Oh, and and we, we really believe that data scientists should be the ones authoring these pipelines and not engineers, because engineers are not, uh, they don't understand what's required for the project at the end of the day, unless you're just building base um, uh, values or base entities. If it's anything derived or complex, then the data scientist should be doing that. Um, of course, it didn't scale anything they built, because they were, didn't understand Spark or any of these distributed execution platforms. So that's another problem we try to solve. Um, Real-time features required engineers. This is one of the biggest challenges for us, is that often you'd have data scientists writing data processing pipelines that create features. So it would happen something like this, where you have raw data, you process the data, you create features, you train a machine learning model, the model is put into production. The model is wrapped in an application, that's their model serving application. But in production, it's gonna get a request, a trigger essentially, that'll um, ask it to infer something. At that point in time, it needs features, but those features need to be available within milliseconds. So engineers need to come in to um, write the feature transformations to produce real-time features, and this often requires streaming data from Kafka or PubSub or some stream, and it means you re-implement those features, um, and it's not free. They're not gonna give you hundreds or thousands of features like you would have in Batch. They're gonna give you two or three of your most important ones. So we wanted something that gave, gave us real-time features for free. And then the consistency between training and serving. If you have people or engineers redeveloping and uh, serving, then you have an inconsistency because often feature transformations in batch are done in Python or SQL, but they're, used, they're done in Scala or Java or in some other language in production. And it, it, you'll, you'll find that there's a model drift there where your training and your inference are happening on different data. And is, there's a real scope for uh, bugs to creep in there. Another problem that we were trying to solve was this discovery problem. Data scientists were siloed, and they, didn't, they couldn't see what other data scientists were doing unless they spoke to them over lunch or in some way. So the visibility and the discovery of features was really one of the key things that we were trying to solve by centralizing the, all the features into a central platform. And then hand in hand with that is standardization. When you're working with, especially with business stakeholders, they want to be able to understand the model and what went into the model and reason about the features because it's not just, because there's an overlap between features and, and metrics essentially. And business metrics features often, um, you know, or there's a massive overlap there. So standardizing what it is that your feature represents is very important for us. So the platform, just to recap, the platform should allow us to standardize feature definitions. All right, I'll continue to use this one. <laughs> okay, so we want to standardize feature definitions. Um, very important. The atomic unit of the feature would be the central thing that we focus on in this platform. 
Hazırım. Yeah, this is going to be easier. Sorry. So we wanted to provide a means for means for data scientists to author or publish features. So um, both in batch and in streaming. So uh, one thing that's important to know here is that batch and streaming in this context refers to the source. It doesn't refer to the destination. So all these features need to be available in the training store as well as in your uh, serving store. And in serving, it needs to be at low latency. Um, we needed to be able to produce training sets to train our models. Um, we needed these uh, features to be able to, or the production services to be able to uh, reach these features um, in serving. And then allow for discovery of these features and then abstract away the engineering problem. And abstracting the way engineering is the number one thing that we're focusing on here is drawing that line between allowing them, a flex to give them a flexible system where they can create features, access these features in production, or train their model, and at the same time not have to worry about storage or scheduling or automation or dead letter queues or retries or anything like that. So a, a, good, a good way to talk about this is in the context of a specific problem that we had. So this is one of the models that we have in production, and it's one of the first ones we made, actually. It's called the allocation model or the dispatch model. So basically, it's very simple. All the right-handing companies have some variant of this. Um, if you're a customer and you want to go to your destination, uh, which driver do we send to you? And this is actually a very feature-driven model because there are d different ways that you can take approach this problem. So you can look at the driver side. Uh, you can say, OK, this driver hasn't had an opportunity in a long time. This driver is um, heading to his home area. Um, so you can op optimize for that. Or you can look at the customer. What is these cl the closest driver? Or what is his ETA to the destination? All these types of things. Or you can try and minimize burn or increase revenue or any all these other factors. So this model lives and dies by the features that you have available to it. So it's very representative of the, our typical features. Uh, sorry, our, our use cases. So we looked at some of the features. And so some of the features you'd find are driver-related features, like the location, the speed, the direction, ETAs. You'd have customer-related features, like the profile of the customer, behavior, actions, uh, regional or area-related features, like what, how many, what is your supply base looking like in that area, or what is your demand in that area, or temporal features, like the time of the day, the day of the week. Um, is it a holiday? So in Indonesia, you often find that uh, there are these big holidays like Ramadan where um, the user behavior changes completely and your models get thrown off by that. So you need to have features that allow you to, uh, to, to account for that. So we, we took these features and we kind of tried to figure out what are the common denominators of what our system should be able to support. So we knew we needed to have entity level grouping as well. So that'll be the base of what, where our features are grouped on, it's entities. So support for entities as well as composite entities are very important. And we knew that in training and in serving, the data would be in a tabular form. So, so entities really make sense on the table level. Um, and then you'd access specific feature columns by keys on the entity key. Um, of course, you'd also have composite entities. And that'll be something like well, one area to another area has a specific feature, like the average ETA between those two areas. Um, the process of what creates those features is another grouping. So we can say that some features are batch only, so SQL transformed with SQL. You'll just have some more batch data, but it can also be an event stream. Then you have granularities or important to categorize your features in, um, so that you'll have different access patterns based on the granularity, because if you have transactional data, for example, that's your labeled data, and you join features onto that, you're typically not going to join multiple granularities of data onto that. You're typically going to have a single type of granularity depending on um, the, le yeah, the level of granularity that you want your labels to be, to be at. And then the interesting thing that we found out is that some of the features needed to be complex. So when, I st when we started the project, we anticipated that we'd only need integers and floats and booleans and strings and maybe some basic primitives for this feature platform. But what we later found was that some of the models actually required uh, complex data structures, especially if you're working with TensorFlow. Internal to the model, uh, the model itself, you can have transformations. So one of our data scientists wrote a model that um, would take GPS location data um, over 40 minutes of a specific driver, and it would try and anticipate if the driver is spoofing his location. 
and the drivers would sometimes do this in order to get closer to where um, the customers were so that there would be assigned rights. But this model doesn't just take uh, in primitives, it takes uh, uh, this, whole, this, this list of complex values. So that's something we needed to support. So the first thing we did was we said, okay, if we're talking about features as our main focus for this platform, we needed some way to um, standardize what we meant by that. So we, we create, came up with a specification. Basically, you can compare this to Kubernetes manifests. So basically, this is a minimal description of what a feature is. In this case, we, one of the things that you'll notice here is this doesn't tell you how to create the feature. So what we did at the start of this project was we said, we're going to se separate creation of features from storage of features. And this is very important because it means your store, your feature platform is agnostic to what creates a feature because you sometimes will have CSVs creating features. You'll have BQ or some data store or you'll have a stream. Whatever the person um, creating a feature uses um, shouldn't determine how the specification is made. That can be a separate system. Um, but the key things here to note are the value type being an integer, the entity that this feature is stored on, um, and then also some other useful things like the owner description and where the source code lives. So, so armed with this feature specification, um, our system had a way to reason about features traveling through um, fr from, from creation all the way to access. So w once we had the specifications, we knew we needed to, s to have at least two ways of creating features, one batch way and one streaming workflow. So these two workflows are what we needed to present to the data scientists as tools in their toolbox. And the way we saw this was that the easy one would always be the batch one because that's where the exploration would happen and the streaming one would be kind of the last mile, the last uh, option where it's a lot more complex and it requires more engineering effort but it can always do what you want it to do um, as long as you spend enough effort in that because that will always match your latency requirements. So the first one we tried to do is the, the SQL one or the batch one. And so we chose SQL because our primary data store is BigQuery. It's a relational database and the easiest, it's the thing that the data scientists are the most comfortable in. Um, so there's nothing really spectacular about SQL. So we just asked them to write some SQL query. It's parameterized. They can't set parameters um, as hard coded. Um, they have to use our parameters and we actually try and detect if they're trying to do really complex joins or anything out of the, out of the ordinary. So the first step is writing a SQL query and then you'll have multiple col columns coming from that. So you can have 10 features coming from one query. Then you write a specification. So this is the interesting part. So, okay, we use a lot of YAML. Uh, it's a very convenient format for us to write specifications. And here we just have a very basic uh, creation specification. So this goes hand in hand with the SQL query and it tells us how the columns from the SQL query maps onto features that have definitions or specifications within our system. Um, and then it tells some basic things like where, what entity does this live on, um, what scheduling frequency do you want to have, do you want to do backfills, um, and, and obviously the ownership as well. Um, but th the reason we took this approach was because of problems we had with Airflow previously. So we wanted to abstract away the creation of DAGs in Airflow. I'm, sh I'm not sure if you guys have used Airflow before, I'm sure some of you have. Um, but what we found was that was a big source of the technical debt is that Airflow is very powerful and flexible, but it allows people to do things that are, uh, that make it very difficult to one, develop in the first place because it gives you things like templating, but you can't really run a templated bash script or SQL script easily unless you use Airflow. So you're tightly coupled to it. It also doesn't force you to containerize. So you're often, um, you, you, we saw da uh, DAGs that would rewrite the path variable or fill up a database or um, that doesn't clean up after, it's, after itself. So we'd have our clusters becoming corrupted by some of the DAG runs. So what we did is we built a tool called Clockwork that would take in these specifications, it would take in the SQL queries, and it's basically a glorified templater. So as a data scientist, you write a specification and go, you, you put that, uh, these specifications and SQL queries as input into Clockwork and it builds all your DAGs for Airflow. And this is an idempotent process and you can just make a change in your YAML config and then rebuild the, that DAG 
And this was very powerful for us. And we went from a lot of downtime in some of these pipelines to virtually zero because you can just, as an engineer, update the template and then all of your DAGs benefit from that. Um, so this is one of the things that we did. And so you'll have something like a, a DAG for a driver daily or a customer daily or a customer minute. And it'll have all the feature uh, features that need to be created there and all of the SQL queries. So, so this is how we solved the batch process and we abstracted away the engineering. So let's talk about the real-time aspect of this. That's the second thing that we needed to solve. We looked at a lot of real-time streaming or data processing uh, libraries. Um, because we're on Google Cloud, uh, we did have an, a bias towards some of these tools, but we basically considered Spark, Flink, and Beam. And the one we eventually chose was Apache Beam, mostly because of some of the, uh, the concepts that it has. So it was very close between Beam and Flink um, because of the concept of, or the one advantage that it has in unifying batch and stream. So this benefit um, is really powerful for feature transformations because it means you can define a feature once. So if you define a feature once in Flink or in Beam, then you can apply it to batch data, bounded data, or you can apply it to stream data. Um, so that, um, spoiler. Uh, that's all the one problem that we have. Now we can actually apply feature transformations on BQ data, on flat files like CSVs, on events on Kafka, and we can produce an output. And it also solves our second problem, which is the consistency between serving and training. So if you have multiple stores um, that have different roles, if, if you have an upstream transformation in Beam, uh, you can just have different I.O. that syncs into the different stores that you have. So, so there's never an inconsistency, and you just set the expiration policy in your serving store to be lower. Maybe you just keep it on a, okay, this is on a per feature basis, but maybe days or a month. And you can have in your training store, build up that data over months of uh, time. And the reason why Beam is very compelling for us is because we can run it on Dataflow, so it's completely serverless. We don't have to manage any infrastructure, and that's really very uh, useful for us. Um, yeah, so we don't have to have any Flink or Spark clusters. Although when we product productize this platform, we do allow you to run it locally without Dataflow. So you, if you, we have a Helm install that will use uh, f just Flink runners to execute the streaming pipelines. And then finally, there's no lock-in because you can migrate to any other runners. So just an example of a feature transformation. Uh, this transformation looks at or tries to find the driver trip cr uh, count, the trip count per driver, so based on events that have come in. So this is just a very basic example. Uh, it essentially is it's written in Python, although typically you'd write your transformations in Java if you are writing Beam code. The Java feature set is a lot larger than Python. Python is basically just lambdas. There's no windowing or um, any complex features there. I don't think you can even do stream joins in Python yet. Um, so this one just looks at some trips, it filters the successful ones, builds a key out of that or a map out of that, and then does a combine, uh, basically group by. So it's a P collection that you, you apply transformations to and you are left with another collection at the end. And that's, that's all you need to do to do feature transformations in Beam. So really powerful. Um, but it does get complex if you are writing Java code, if you're doing stream joins, if you're managing state, if you're doing any kind of complex business logic like sessions. You never get around that problem of uh, having to deal with out-of-order out events um, and watermarks and those kinds of things. But Beam really solves the use case of um, uh, real-time, low-latency features um, uh, that we sometimes require. So now that we have ways to publish our, our features and stream and for transformations, we knew that we needed to build the store it itself. So we looked at how our, our users would use it, our clients would use it. So our, our users are data scientists that want to explore the store, that want to maybe just do queries on the store, build data sets, and then um, do some EDA on that, exploratory data analysis, or train a model locally. Then in production, we'd have pipelines that could also hit the store to build large data sets to train models. And at the same time, we'd have model serving applications hitting the store for low latency access to the same features. So we looked at a lot of databases. We looked at the Hives and the Elasticsearch and the Cassandras and um, everything. We, we basically evaluated everything um, that, that even remotely is in use in, in any other company. 
Um, we realized that we couldn't find one solution that fit all of these use cases, so we split it up into multiple stores, into training stores and into serving stores. Although for the moment, we only have one training store. So the training store requirements are large-scale data processing, so tens or hundreds of terabytes um, it should easily be able to handle, and it's multi-tenant. It should be multi-tenant. Um, handle large sparse key spaces. So this applies to both serving and training. So one of the things that we found was that, let's say you have a feature that is an area to area. So it's a composite entity between two areas, and um, you, you bucket that into 30 minute windows. So let's say just the average time it takes to drive between, or to take a customer between two areas um, in a specific time of the day. That would be a very large uh, key space. So it would be about two billion keys in that space, but the data would be sparse. So you'd need a store that could allow you to have sparse data without it becoming costly. Um, we'd need joins because we'd have label data and you need to be able to join feature data onto label data. Obviously, the store needs to be easy to use if you're going to expose it to data scientists unless you're going to build a API or a UI on top of that. So the one we eventually settled on, which is the same one we're using for transformations, and it's our store as well. Um, so this is our first uh, store, is BigQuery. And the reason why BigQuery is so compelling for us is, one, there's no infrastructure. It's completely managed. Two, SQL, data science, are familiar with it. There's already authentication and access controls in our store. Um, it scales to whatever we want. Um, it can handle any amount of data that we can currently throw at it. Um, it integrates with a lot of the services that we use, like ML Engine, Dataflow, GCS. And it contains our labeled data. So we thought that if we were to introduce a new store for training, um, let's say we chose Hive, how, how would we join the feature data onto our, our labeled data? So if our raw data, our transaction data is in, in BigQuery, that is actually a big challenge. And so our primary store at the moment, um, the one that we selected above Hive and um, Presto and object stores, is, is BigQuery. So in terms of the serving store, our requirements were completely different. We needed very low latency reads. And the reason we need this is because if you have a model serving application, typically, or at least at Gojek, we have like 50 to 100 milliseconds to do inference. That's all we get. You don't get anything more than that. So you don't want to spend more than 10% or 20% of your time doing boilerplate or non-business logic uh, code. So you don't want to do feature collection or feature transformations uh, that really uses up a lot of that SLO or SLA. Um, most of the time should be spent in your model. So that's where the processing should happen. So we wanted low latency reads from the store. Then um, what often happens is that if you've got peaks, so let's say a, sp a, a sports stadium empties out or a music concert uh, is on, you often have um, large spikes of users requesting bookings or trips to go back home or to go to some event. And the drivers know this. They, they, they follow the news and so they're all going to be outside of the stadium or event hall. And you'll get feature lookups for all of those same drivers over and over. And in your data store, um, you'll have the same keys being hit. And for some data stores, this is actually a very bad thing, and it can really affect the performance when you have those hotspots. But we needed to be able to handle either um, at peak load 150,000 uh, key lookups for one feature um, per second, um, or we need some kind of clever way to handle caching as well. And of course, we needed to store terabytes of data because the key space problem is the same for as for training. Um, so you'd have um, you have terabytes and terabytes of feature data that you want to store. Theoretically, this system needed to support at least 1,000 to 10,000-ish features. That's the order of magnitude that we were working in. Uh, we needed persistence because uh, one of the interesting things about uh, doing feature transformations is that sometimes you need to normalize features based on past features. So the store itself would need to be hit during a stream transformation. So Let's take something like uh, drivers, or let's say, let's say there's a restaurant and they're giving out orders, and you don't know if they're giving out a lot of orders or not. So you want to normalize, let's say, the hourly order rate of, based on the average hourly order rate over the last three months. So for that, you need persistence. The data cannot be just ephemeral. 
And then, of course, linearly scalable because we need to be able to scale to any kind of, of load, especially if we're expanding into new markets. The amount of data is really growing a lot. So our primary store that we chose was Bigtable. I'm not sure if anybody here has used Bigtable before, but the performance characteristics really matched what we needed. Um, and it's, it's actually, it, we couldn't actually find any data store or service that, that could match it on Google Cloud. So we're on Google Cloud, so we're limited by the fact that um, that is our, our cloud provider. So we, we can only choose from Google Cloud or open source technologies. So the cool thing about Bigtable is that it actually allows a lot of reads and writes per second. So um, 10,000 per node combined reads and writes. And it guarantees that those will be at 10 milliseconds or less. Now, this doesn't really sound that amazing if you compare it to something like Redis. Uh, but there are some other characteristics of Bigtable that make it really amazing, actually. So one, there's no infrastructure. Not, that's not entirely true. So there are nodes that are provisioned, but you don't really manage those nodes. You just write and read to the database. Um, but the interesting thing about Bigtable is that one, it's highly scalable. So you can just add nodes and it'll linearly add capacity. So if you want 10, like if you want 100,000 reads and writes per second, then you just have 10 nodes. So, and it'll always be 10 milliseconds per read and write. But the, the best thing about it is the capacity that it has. So when we started, we were using Redis for a lot of our uh, uh, serving and for our feature stores, or our, basically our project level feature stores. But we could never get across that to, let's say, 500 gigabyte range into the terabyte range with Redis, unless you do something like sharding or clustering. Um, the thing with Bigtable is it actually wants you to store a lot of data. So it, if you store anything less than 300 gigabytes, then it doesn't perform well at all. If you store terabytes of data in it, then it can really optimize the way the data is laid out. And so as our primary store for feature data that's not read that quickly, um, but relatively quickly, we use Bigtable. But there's also a use case, oh, sorry, and it's persistent, of course. But there's also a use case for Redis. And Redis is our secondary store. And the reason we use Redis is for some feature values, like let's say the driver's location or its speed or is, or is um, altitude or things like that where each update happens basically on a per second or every couple of second uh, level. So if you have 500,000 drivers and every second there's an update coming and you need to have a stream transformation and write that into a database, it's going to be very expensive if you do that in Bigtable because you're going to have to provision tens of nodes. So for that we use Redis and then on a feature level in our specification we say please use Redis for this feature. And the implication of that is that uh, that data is ephemeral. If that Redis node goes down, you're going to lose it and we're going to bring it back up. But there's no guarantee that it's going to be there in a month's time. And if you want that, you need to use Bigtable. Um, but the cool thing about this is that if there's any kind of failure in the stream processing and stream processing picks up again, then if you get this real surge of writes, Redis can easily handle that. And it's not going to affect access. Because you've got two sides here. You've got the writes into the database, and you've got the reads out. And if your writes are too high, then it's going to affect your reads out, of course. And the final thing we did to basically abstract this away from our, um, our clients was to build a serving API. So the serving API has a couple of features. Um, basically, what it is is an engine, an API that you can query with a specific query format. And the API will deconstruct that query and it will uh, look up all the feature values from the store. So it'll do Redis lookups and Bigtable lookups and whatever data store that we have in serving. It does intelligent things like caching, load balancing across these uh, uh, nodes, and it does failover, it does rate limiting, so it does quality of service control and authentication. This was really important for us because also this helps a lot um, in terms, just, just in terms of caching um, if we're using Bigtable and you're hitting those same hotspots over and over. So this is how we solved um, basically going from our three data stores, BigQuery, Cloud Storage, Kafka, doing transformations, giving data science as a way to author um, features for, for batch and stream, abstracting away all the infrastructure of storage. They don't have to worry about that. They only have to worry about how can they query their features in serving and how can they train their model in, uh, on BigQuery. So with BigQuery, it's easy. You can just export a CSV and you can train your model on that. Um, but, but often you want to extend the platform. And we really like the approach that Kubernetes took um, in having these manifests and specifications. Um, so we kind of modeled our platform on that. 
in that you'd have essentially YAML files or JSON files that you can extend and then we can build on top of this platform. So we can build a system that looks at the feature store's feature specifications and then take action on that. Essentially that controller or CRD concept. So a very limited way in which we've done this is through our own uh, way of doing annotations. Um, so we allow you to add arbitrary configurations to the feature specification and this allows us to do more complex uh, things inside of our platform. So one of the things we did is, um, so let's say you've got, so in, in our system, in our use case, everything is a protobuf and everything is basically stored in or, tr or transmitted in bytes uh, on the wire. Um, so even if your type is an integer or a string, it's still going to be sent as proto. So if you can imagine now, if you store that value in BigQuery and you give somebody access to that table, it's not going to be text, it's not going to be a value, it's going to be bytes, it's unreadable. So one of the ways we solve that is by just giving you a way to define what your data is. So we, we, you just specify some key values, you say this is my data type, it's a protobuf. When you going, when you write to, to the warehouse, um, just decode that, marshal it into JSON and then our system or the platform itself will have specific hook points where it will trigger um, these conditional uh, steps and it will decode the data and then it will store it in the right format for you. Another thing that we did here was to add the option to um, do dis distribution checking. So this is basically a way that we do in-flight data checking when you're streaming in your raw data and transforming features and then storing it at the store step we do a check to see that there's nothing anomalous about your data. And the way that you do that is by having options as well where you can say um, the discrete value um, limits should be within these range, re ranges, within this range. Um, and then what should happen when there's uh, anomalous event? Should you warn or should you prevent the write to go through? And this check actually happens both at ingestion into the store as well as access from the serving API. Um, and obviously you can change the specification after data is already written into the stores and that's why we have dual checks both on write and on read. Um, but this is, this option section is really the, the, one of the areas that we're going to focus on adding functionality um, especially when you want to couple the creations uh, pipelines into the storage pipeline, sorry the, the storage layer. Um, and then the next thing we built was a feature explorer. So internally this platform is called Feast. It's just a com combination of feature store. And we wanted to solve the discovery problem. And we did that by just building a simple UI where you could explore all the features that have been de defined within, um, within our platform. And we can look at features and the entities. You can look at the jobs that are currently running. So if there's an ingestion running, um, if there's uh, any uh, activity on some of the topics in Kafka, how many features are being read in there. And then you can drill into those specific features and have, look at more detail on them. So this is one of the components that we're currently building out. Um, and the, the goal of this, this UI will be, uh, well these are some of the, the things that we want. We want discovery. So if somebody authors a feature, they should just, it should be vis visible here and it should be accessible. Um, we want to avoid a case where people are developing features in silos. We want to have a situation where a new joiner can come on to um, or join the team, train a model without doing any feature engineering whatsoever. And they should just come onto this platform, select as a, like a shopping cart the features that they want, export it to a CSV or to some table and then train a model. Um, and feature management is also something that we wanted. So stopping and starting features. Um, stopping ingestion, doing, adding validation, um, changing the data type or version of the feature. Um, so, and then one of the things that, that we're doing now is that when you've got a complete uh, feature platform and you're logging ingestion, you're logging creation, you're looking at how these features are used for training models, you're looking at what feature is the most uh, indicative or the most useful for the model to predict outcomes which features are being used the most from your serving API and um, what are the confidences in the predictions that that model has in production. If you log all of those things together, you actually have a very uh, powerful picture, uh, aggregated picture of which features are useful. And based on that, so our, our approach at the moment is we expose that data to data scientists and then we 
and then when new data scientists come on, they can have a look at those really, really powerful features. And also as an engineer, that also gives me an idea of which features I should be targeting for QA because uh, often somebody's writing this feature, nobody looks at the code that created it, but um, you, you as an engineer need to obviously validate that. And on this platform, you can also then look at um, the system health, there's how your stores are holding up. You can look at um, your link to the source code. So if you want to investigate the source code, you can do that. You can look at the BigQuery view. So, so this really becomes a center point where people can discuss w a feature and the standard of the feature. So at the end of the day, just to kind of summarize, um, we built a platform that one, solved the, the way that we abstract engineering um, from data scientists. It gives them a way to author, author features, train their models on these features, serve on these features in production, and discover new features. Um, they don't have to worry about any kind of infrastructure management or writing ETLs or anything in Airflow anymore. They can simply full focus on the business logic. And in terms of the time effect that this has had, so definitely this has dramatically changed the way that we do data science. Uh, it dramatically decreased the amount of engineering effort that data scientists do. Um, it's somewhat more engineering effort for the engineers on this project. But because we have a ratio of about four data scientists to one engineer inside the data science team, um, this is very useful because it frees up a lot of our data uh, our engineers um, to focus on the product itself instead of focusing on the projects. Um, and then just the impact, faster time to market because we don't have to rebuild features or rebuild streams. Um, improve customer experience because our models are more accurate. Um, we have more features to choose from. We can support more customers per data scientist because um, yeah, they're, high, they're more leveraged at the moment. And ultimately, this meant less infrastructure. All right, I think that's it for me. Thanks. Hi. Um, thanks for talking, that's great. Um, one question about you sort of talk about removing the need for the data scientists to author the features themselves kind of thing. But then you kind of, I might have just missed a bit, in terms of the beam processing, are they authoring that section themselves? Well, no, that's, well, they're definitely involved because they then generally define the business logic that goes into that. Because especially with some features, it's very complex and, but, we can't, so it depends on the type of feature that you make. If you're just doing something that's a, basically like an input, lambda, output, that's very easy. Data science can write that. If it's anything that's complex with joins, um, with windowing, with watermarks, and early firing and late firing, there's no way that data science will do that. So that's a joint pro process at the moment. Yeah. But we needed something that could support that. Yeah. Cool. Sounds similar to us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not an easy one to solve. <laughs>